our next talk, um, we're honored to have uh, Professor Chow Ray here to share with us his thoughts about coupling between electromagnetics and gravity waves uh, via superconducting rings. So it, it really builds upon the work that Nathan has done. Now, uh, Ray and I have never had a chance to collaborate or work together, but I've followed his work for many, many years. Um, he was a, a professor of physics at UC Berkeley, uh, where I also went to school. I didn't know Ray, Ray then, I was a double E uh, major. And then he went on to be, I believe, the first dean of engineering at UC Merced and a professor there at UC Merced when uh, the California school system started that new university. And so I've always been intrigued by his uh, coupling between EM and gravity, uh, usually through some quantum effect, uh, through superconducting sheets and um, rigid wave functions is what I really, and then I started asking Nathan about the rigid wave function and he had to tell me that, well, you know, based on Nathan's math, uh, that's not gonna work, but that did not dissuade Ray at all because he's come up with, um, you know, alternate ways that really do appear to work um, in order to do that coupling. And also, I always really liked his work on superluminal behavior through photonic crystals and, and um, circuits that, you know, of course, don't send information superluminally, but the, the signals, um, you know, the waveform uh, does go through. I'm probably not saying that entirely accurately but uh, a lot of very interesting work. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your, your work with us today, Ray. Um, if you'd like to share your screen. Uh, Ray, I think you might be muted still. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, no, we don't see your screen yet. I'd like to oh, dear. speak about... Uh, um, how do I do this? Uh, Under the, the green uh, share screen. Oh, okay. Let on me... the bottom. And so you can collect share screen and then you can select which part of your desktop you wanna share. Yes, we see your desktop now. You know, if you like, Ray, I do have your slides if you would like me to share them for you. Oh, I think you're muted uh, again. Okay. Oh, okay. hi. <laughs> now can you see? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, let's try the slideshow and the presenter view. Let's see if it works. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, perfect. Uh, okay. Let, let me just make sure I I, I don't record. Uh, record. So I'm recording your talk now. Oh, you are. So yes, okay. I am. Yes. 
Okay, so let me just uh, start. Uh, I'm going to talk about the transduction of electromagnetic and gravitational I'd waves. I'd like to oh, speak dear. about the trans possibility. Oh dear, there's some problem. Uh, I, I made a recording, a test recording before, and I, 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 I didn't. How do I clear? How do I do this? I have to stop the recording. Clear. Okay. Let, Let's try this again. I'm so sorry. Oh, no worries. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, but the title of my talk is Transduction of Electromagnetic and Gravitational Waves via Levitated uh, Superconducting Charge Rings and Hertz-like Experiment. So let me go to the next. Uh, here's the outline of my talk. Um, let me try to use a laser point and see if it works. Yeah, so uh, transduction from gravitational to electromagnetic waves occurs via levitated charge superconducting rings without the mediation of Einstein's coupling constant, kappa, which couples uh, the stress energy tensor to the Einstein tensor, uh, curvature tensor. And uh, it's a very, very small quantity. It's eight pi times Newton's constant G divided by uh, the speed of light to the fourth power. Numerically, this is on the order of two times 10 to the minus 43, and the units are inverse Newtons. And this constant is so tiny that uh, conventional wisdom is that you cannot generate gravitational waves in the lab. The only place that gravitational waves can be generated is in uh, astrophysical situations. Uh, and of course, we know from LIGO that that's true because uh, LIGO has uh, detected uh, the gravitational waves from merging black holes. Uh, recently, and so this seems to uh, validate this conventional viewpoint. However, I'd like to present uh, an alternative um, non-conventional viewpoint based on the fact that uh, the uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, there are uh, certain so super selection rules that lead to boundary conditions, and these boundary conditions uh, uh, are independent of this constant so that um, it, it evades the smallness of this. So basically, uh, I'm going to see, uh, uh, try to persuade you that transduction can occur uh, not only from gravitational to electromagnetic waves, but vice versa from electromagnetic to gravitational waves, again, without the mediation of this tiny, tiny uh, Einstein coupling constant. And this uh, will lead to the possibility of a Hertz-like experiment, uh, which uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, leads to the possibility of communications uh, and, uh, by a gravitational radiation. Uh, and this is all based on periodic boundary conditions that lead to uh, mean resonances. I'll explain what mean resonances are. And uh, these resonances have very, very large cross sections that evade the smallness of Einstein's coupling constant. And uh, furthermore, there is a quantum super selection rule that leads to a Meissner-like expulsion, I believe, of the gravitational wave fields that also evades the smallness of Einstein's coupling constant. And therefore, experiments in the lab that generate gravitational waves as well as to detect them are possible. So um, uh, uh, I'll get to the first uh, uh, version of transduction, which is from gravitational waves to electromagnetic wave transduction. 
in which energy is transferred from the gravitational to an electromagnetic wave via the charge of two rings. Uh, the rings have, of course, uh, both charge and mass. Here they are indicated in yellow. Uh, and they are superconducting because uh, super, uh, the uh, wave function of the superconductor and its single valueness will come in, in an important way. Uh, but because they are superconducting, they can be levitated. So imagine that we have uh, prepared these rings with trapped magnetic flux lines here uh, indicated in blue. These magnetic fields uh, will uh, levitate these rings above um, a, say, stub cavity. That's what we're using in our lab at uh, Merced. Uh, um, in the lab that I'm collaborating with Jay Sharping uh, to do these levitation experiments. And we have seen levitation of uh, magnets. We are about to initiate some experiments levitating superconducting rings like this. But uh, imagine that we have levitated these rings and that then we have a gravitational wave coming in uh, towards uh, the middle of the two rings. And um, the distance between the rings will be affected by the gravitational wave because what a gravitational wave does is that it squeezes and stretches the space uh, itself between the rings so that the distance D of T, that is a gap distance between these uh, 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 rings is uh, modulated by the gravitational waves so that the distance uh, alternately uh, increases and decreases with time sinusoidally. And what that does is the following. If, if we now have charges uh, on these rings and imagine that we prepare these charges by implanting ions via uh, RF the discharge which drives uh, the ions into the surface of the ring so that uh, these plus signs indicate implanted ions that are implanted deep inside the surface. And that means that the charges are, are, are forced to move when the ionic lattice, <coughs> ionic lattice of the rings move, then the charges move. So if the rings uh, move by drawing uh, because of the uh, gravitational wave coming in and uh, causing the distance between them to decrease, say, with time, these plus charges will approach the tip of this antenna, inducing uh, instantaneous negative charge, and and uh, and and uh, <coughs> the. Um, Opposite effect occurs when the uh, space is expanded by the gravitational wave, the charges recede from the tip and so on and so forth. And that induces currents that flow from the tip into a coax cable, and therefore it generates a gravitational wave. So here is a way we can transform a gravitational wave into an electromagnetic wave, in the electromagnetic wave. Just to be uh, to give an example, for example, this gravitational wave could occur at um, microwave frequencies, say around 10 gigahertz, that comes from uh, the, the Big Bang, say, in uh, gravitational analog of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So these waves can then be detected uh, via the uh, transduction. Uh, into electromagnetic waves. And so in this way, we can detect the primordial gravitational wave uh, from the Big Bang. Um, so this is uh, pretty clearly uh, doable because uh, we are not involving Einstein's coupling constant in this kind of coupling. And uh, to use technical language, we are using only the geodesic deviation equations of motion 
which do not involve Einstein's constant. And so this is a doable uh, construction. This I think everybody will agree with. What is a little bit more controversial is that the reverse process where we uh, uh, inject a grav uh, not, we inject an electromagnetic wave into the antenna and thereby generate a gravitational wave that this will occur also without uh, the intervention of uh, or the mediation of Einstein's coupling constant. Uh, because uh, the conventional viewpoint is that in order to generate gravitational waves, uh, uh, you need to uh, have the mediation of Einstein's uh, coupling constant. Uh, but uh, I shall argue that um, by time reversal symmetry, um, the, uh, this process also will occur without the mediation of Einstein's coupling constant. Now, uh, if that is true, then we can consider uh, a Hertz-like experiment. A Hertz-like experiment is the following, that we make two duplicate, duplicate copies of these pairs of rings, and we place them into two Faraday cages, one on the left, and they let them be grounded, just to be uh, uh, sure that they are uh, electromagnetic fields. Um, and likewise, we uh, have the second pair of rings and closed in a second separated uh, Faraday cage, which is also grounded. Now, therefore, there is no way that we can uh, communicate uh, via the electromagnetic waves because of the Faraday cages, but the gravitational waves will penetrate through the Faraday cage and they will uh, go from the left uh, Faraday cage uh, to the right one. And therefore, in principle, we could communicate uh, via the, uh, the gravitational waves through the uh, Hertz-like experiment. So think of it this way, this left Faraday cage is a transmitter and the uh, second, the right Faraday cage is the receiver. And so we have uh, repeated uh, Hertz's experiment for electromagnetic waves with gravitational waves by means of this apparatus. Um, now, uh, the, uh, actually there has been work much earlier by uh, Gerstenstein and what is now called the Gerstenstein process in uh, which he considered, uh, uh, the, he called it the forward uh, transduction process where you convert electromagnetic waves into gravitational waves, but he did not have uh, these rings of superconductors. He considered rather just applying a magnetic field to the vacuum and the mac uh, vacuum magnetic field is sufficient to convert uh, uh, electromagnetic waves into gravitational waves uh, in a transduction process. But in his process, the Einstein um, uh, constant, coupling constant is involved. And so the Gerstenstein transduction process is very tiny, but in principle, it's there. But, and he points out that it could be used to detect astrophysical uh, uh, sources uh, uh, where, because uh, the magnetic field of the galaxy can convert uh, light waves into gravitational waves. Uh, that, and, but we are uh, considering instead uh, these levitated uh, charged ring systems, which will lead to a much larger effect, we believe, than the Gerstenstein effect. Uh, in particular, uh, the uh, electromagnetic wave to gravitational wave conversion is going to not involve Einstein's coupling constant, unlike Gerstenstein's effect. And um, 
so uh, the, this, the nevertheless, will follow Gershenstein. We'll call this the forward construction or forward conversion process. And then um, the inverse process will follow again. Gershenstein's nomenclature is where a gravitational wave comes in and then is converted into an electromagnetic wave. Now, uh, via the, these uh, superconducting uh, levitated charged superconducting rings. Now, one thing I'm going to do is to make a, a movie of these two processes and uh, watch what happens when I uh, undergo time reversal symmetry. When time is reversed, the arrows for the gravitational wave and the electromagnetic, the red and green arrows reverse in sign obviously. So these two processes clearly are um, related to each other by time reversal symmetry. And time reversal symmetry would uh, me, uh, imply that if you have the forward process, you can have the inverse process with equal um, conversion efficiencies. And we shall see that uh, explicitly by looking at these processes in detail, that's true. Okay, so first to re, re, um, to remind uh, us ourselves of time reversal symmetry, uh, we conclude that one concludes the forward that the forward and inverse uh, processes should have equal transduction efficiencies. This is based, of course, on time reversal symmetry. Incoming wave becomes an outgoing wave and vice versa upon time reversal. And therefore a Hertz-like experiment, uh, Hertz-like experiment should be possible. So returning to the Hertz-like experiment, here's the transmitter on the left uh, and the receiver on the right, the, uh, but the one on the left will call forward conversion. The one on the right will call inverse conversion. And so this is a kind of uh, I'll give it name, uh, nickname due to my son-in-law, he invented this. He called this gravity radio. So you have a way to com uh, communicate via ra uh, gravitational radiation and he called it gravity radio. It's a great name. So uh, this should uh, be possible uh, because of the fact that these processes do not involve Einstein's coupling constant, which is too, so tiny. Uh, and so this opens up lab experiments, if this is true. But we must, uh, however, ask the question, what determines the ratio of the electromagnetic to gravitational wave powers? powers generated in the Hertz-like experiment. Is this a practical experiment uh, to do? And the answer, I believe, is yes, because the charge to mass ratio of the levitated uh, charge rings is what determines the ratio of, of uh, electromagnetic to gravitational wave powers generated by these rings. But uh, in order to uh, uh, discuss this in a, a simple way. Let me first start with what I call the static criticality condition. And what do I mean by criticality? Criticality is this, that um, when you balance uh, Newton and uh, uh, Coulomb, uh, that is uh, the uh, electrostatic and gravitational forces, uh, uh, the static ones, the, then there is a uh, fundamental experimental fact, which is that Coul Coulomb forces for identical charges are repulsive, but uh, Newtonian forces between uh, uh, two masses is attractive. So therefore by adjusting the charge to mass ratio, uh, you can adjust, uh, you can make a transition between a repulsive net force and an attractive net force, you can make a, tra a transition from the Coulomb force being dominant to the net uh, Newtonian force being dominant. And the, 
And at a critical point where they're balanced is what I call criticality. And that is what I call the static criticality condition. I'll come back to the uh, formulation of this, uh, which is um, uh, in the next slide. Uh, but uh, before I do, let me just introduce also the dynamical criticality condition, where instead of balancing the Coulomb and Newtonian forces, I balance the New Laumor uh, and the Einstein powers, the Laumor power generated in the electromagnetic waves and the Einstein power uh, generated in gravitational waves. And I'll call that the dynamical criticality condition. So let's start with a simpler one, static criticality condition. This is simply balancing uh, the Coulomb and Newton forces. So supposing uh, we have the two rings, they, uh, they are charged with the charge Q, both of them, and they have the same mass M. And of course we know from uh, freshman physics uh, that the charges repel, that's these green arrows, the electrostatic force uh, between the two uh, rings due to the charges, their charges is repulsive. And so uh, that's uh, given by in magnitude Q squared, the square of the charges divided by four pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space times the distance R between them squared. It's of course an inverse square law, the Coulomb law. But uh, let's balance that uh, with gravity so that the Newtonian force of gravitation uh, the, indicated by the red arrows uh, points oppositely to the green arrows such that the two forces are balanced and the Newtonian force is gm squared over again inverse r, r squared. So that's the idea of static criticality. So we can then uh, equate the two forces as uh, done in this equation. And now we can s solve very simply for the charge to mass ratio for when that occurs. And you get that the charge to mass ratio is the square root of four pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space times Newton's gravitational constant. And when you put in the numbers, this is uh, uh, turns out to be around uh, 8.6 times 10 to the minus 11 coulombs per kilogram. Now, uh, this is much, uh, uh, this is so small, you might think that you can't do this, but in fact, it's this is uh, something that leads to uh, a, lab, a laboratory experiment because we can have uh, uh, the two rings uh, let me go back to the previous slide. Suppose that we choose the two rings to be on the scale of a microwave wavelength on the scale of inches. Then um, the capacitance of these two rings is on the order of picofarads. And so um, we can easily get this charge to mass ratio to uh, apply to rings if the voltage between these rings is on the order of volts. That's the meaning of the, this charge to mass ratio is that we can arrange um, a mesoscopic or uh, if you like ma macroscopic masses and charges to fulfill this uh, static criticality condition readily in the lab. So let's so then uh, say, uh, look at the other condition, the dynamical criti criticality condition, because this, this involves them equalizing the Lamor and Einstein powers radiated by moving rings. So instead of a static situation, let us now look at a dynamical situation where a gravitational wave comes in, it uh, squeezes and and stretches space so that the distance between the rings is changing sinusoidally with time. That will, of course, uh, generate an electromagnetic wave, but it will also generate a gravitational wave because the masses are moving. And if we equalize those two powers, then what do we get for the charge to mass ratio? 
And that is given in the next slide, the uh, dynamical uh, criticality condition can be stated uh, as follows. The, the Lamor electromagnetic power is equal to the Einstein uh, gravitational power. Uh, we know what the, this power is uh, from Einstein's uh, first paper on gra uh, gravity waves. Uh, it's given by Newton's constant times uh, well, I, I, I'll do it directly for sinusoidal waves. So if the frequency of waves is given by omega, it goes up as the sixth power of the uh, frequency of the wave. Uh, and it's uh, divided by C to the fifth, uh, a huge number. So this is a very small power indeed. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the mass uh, must come in through the mass quadrupole moment. D here is the mass quadrupole moment. It's a tensor. And of course, you must take the time average squared if we're interested in the time average power. And likewise, the same thing happens for electromagnetism when we have oscillating uh, electric quadrupole moment. Uh, Q is the electric quadrupole moment of the oscillating charges. And again, it's a, a tensor and it's uh, time average is what produces the power. And the uh, uh, frequency of the wave is again, omega to the six, uh, so that we notice that the uh, frequencies cancel out, but also importantly, the speed of light to the fifth power that was in the denominator of Einstein's formula cancels out for the Laumor formula. And instead of the uh, Einstein, I mean, sorry, the Newtonian constant G, we have the permittivity of free space. So we can again solve for the charge to mass ratio by taking the ratio of the quadrupole moment to the uh, mass dipole moment, quadrupole moment, and we get the following result. The charge to mass ratio is a little bit different from the static one, but not much. It's 32 pi times the <coughs> permittivity of free space times g. Uh, so this uh, is a factor of eight uh, under the square root, bigger than the previous one, uh, uh, which uh, is four. Uh, instead of four as this prefactor, we now have 32. And that changes this number somewhat, but this does not uh, change the overall result, which is that the <coughs> numbers work out to be favorable to uh, bal be able to balance the powers emitted uh, by the uh, two rings. Now, um, uh, in addition to equalizing the powers, let's also calculate the size of the scattering cross sections of these levitated charged superconducting rings. In the case of the electromagnetic wave scattering, uh, me resonance occurs when the circumference of the ring equals one wavelength. That's the uh, me, first me resonance. And the question here is, does this also happen in the case of the gravitational wave scattering? We shall see that in fact, this does happen because of a quantum superselection rule that leads to the same me resonance occurring for gravitational waves uh, scattering uh, from the rings as for the electromagnetic waves. So let's first do the case of uh, the first me resonance for uh, a, a electromagnetic wave. Consider uh, the snapshot of a wave, uh, electromagnetic wave whose electric field is pointing normal to the surface uh, as is required, of course, if this is a superconductor. And this, suppose this wave is traveling clockwise around the ring. Well, as it goes around the ring, it has to stay uh, radially uh, polarized like this, pointing normal to the surface so that when it comes back, let's demand that it comes back uh, in phase with its uh, initial 
phase, and that means that the, it, uh, there's one wavelength uh, of, uh, that's been traversed, and that's uh, equal to a circumference. Put it in physically, this means that there has to be constructive interference of the wave uh, after one round trip around the ring. And that is uh, 2 pi b, where b is the outer radius, equals a wavelength. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Charles, I need to go to the bathroom. Can I take a break? OK, I'll be well, right back. Yeah, oh, certainly, yes. Maybe we can have a discussion. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Nathan, you know, uh, so Ray has come up with several, you know, maybe half a dozen or eight different concepts that keep evolving. And I think you did an excellent job in one email of summarizing all the different concepts that you have looked at. And I believe he has settled on this approach as the most promising. Yeah. And, and you're looking at the different approaches. Is that your conclusion as well? Yeah, that's true. I mean, Ray is like a fountain of ideas. And, um, but most of them, um, at least in this category of subject, um, are ultimately still for the purpose, um, they're all geared toward, uh, as you mentioned, evading Einstein's very tiny kappa coupling constant. Right. And so the burden for me as his student has always been to just double check mathematically whether that is uh, consistent with what we know, uh, the way that waves are generated and uh, reflected and so forth. So um, I'll probably be sharing a question with him, you know, when he's done about that particular topic, because to answer your question, Charles, all those models are different ways to evade the um, tininess of that uh, Einstein constant in his in the Einstein field equation, and um, I'm I mean just personally I don't know if that ultimately is possible, but I'd love to hear. Of course, you know we we need to see when Ray comes back and we all talk together about it. But that's what it all comes down to, ultimately. Nathan, uh, do you know why it has to be superconducting? I so far I don't see the role of the superconductivity. Oh yeah, that's a good question, Lance. Um, I think that it has to do with the dissipationlessness of a superconductor. So um, I'm I'm sure, of course, Ray will do a great, a much better job than I answering that question. But um, in the work, for instance, that I presented, I think you saw it explicitly. Um, so here, Ray is back. Um, I'm sure he would be happy to address that question. I don't know if now or at the end of the uh, well, what's talk. What's the question? My question, Ray, is uh, why the ring had to be superconducting, but uh, you can answer it at the end if it uh, takes you off track. Uh, we were just... Uh, yes, I, I'll get to that in my next slide. So, uh, but at, at this point, let me just finish uh, this slide. Uh, uh, Let's see, uh, here's the pointer. Uh, okay, so uh, the first me resonance is very simple to understand. It's the circumference is equal to one wavelength. So for the outer perimeter of the ring, it's two pi b, b is the outer radius of the ring, is equal to a wavelength. And the physical meaning of that is that there is constructive interference of a radially polarized wave that's propagating around uh, the outer perimeter of the uh, of the ring with itself. But there's another uh, me resonance due to the inner diameter A, which uh, I'll just skip to the result is two pi times the inner diameter is equal to a different wavelength. So there are two kinds of me resonances for a ring like this. Um, so uh, the uh, important point here is that there are, are periodic boundary conditions. And, as, and this is a point that uh, I want to emphasize that uh, it is not sufficient just to write down uh, field equations, Maxwell's equations, uh, field equations, and, and 
uh, Einstein's equations are field equations. These equations must be sub, uh, supplemented by boundary conditions or else we, uh, it's meaningless to have these field equations without boundary conditions as we teach our students. In particular, there are here periodic boundary conditions, which are very important. And I should emphasize immediately that these periodic boundary conditions do not depend on the sizes of the coupling constants like Einstein's coupling constant or the permittivity of free space or the permit, uh, permeability of free space or uh, and so on and so forth. All the coupling constants do not apply uh, when we look at the periodic boundary conditions. For example, the single valueness of the electromagnetic wave that is a radially polarized wave uh, for the mean resonance after one round trip around the inner parameter, uh, for example, is that the electric field S primed is uh, the arc length of the uh, uh, propagating wave uh, along the inner perimeter plus two pi A, that is the circumference of the round trip must be exactly equal to the uh, electric field as uh, at the beginning of the trip, round trip. And S prime. So this is an example of a periodic boundary condition. And of course, there's a similar one for the outer perimeter. Here it is, uh, the electric field of S, uh, which is now the arc length of, uh, measured along the outer perimeter or uh, outer circumference of the ring plus two pi B, which is the outer uh, radius is equal to the starting field. So these are uh, periodic boundary conditions and they are uh, imposed upon the solutions of the field equations. These And these periodic conditions again, uh, to emphasize, do not depend on any coupling constants. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this leads, uh, and that this uh, will, uh, take some time, which I won't spend. Uh, it results in uh, certain scattering cross sections, which are purely geometrical. One, for example, for the uh, sigma prime for the inner uh, uh, diameter or uh, inner perimeter, a uh, mean resonance is six pi times a squared, where a is the inner radius of the ring and B is uh, 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 the outer perimeter and, and there's a similar scattering cross section six pi B squared. If uh, uh, we look at these expressions, we see that these are simply geometrical uh, cross sections and these geometrical cross sections are, do not depend on coupling constants such as the permittivity or the permeability of free space. They also do not depend on fine structure constant, like uh, Einstein's coupling constant or, and so on. These are purely geometrical coupling constants. They're large because uh, in our case, these rings are an order of inch scale. Now there's another very important uh, 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 feature when we consider the fact that these rings are superconducting rings, which means that their quantum uh, super selection rules, which must play an important role in uh, determining uh, the interaction of these rings with uh, gravitational radiation in particular. Uh, these, uh, an example of a quantum su super selection rule, just to remind ourselves, is the uh, uh, quantum selection rule for charge, uh, that is, if you have charges, they cannot be superposed uh, and that uh, with each other in a uh, uh, in, in in a coherent superposition. And likewise, uh, there is a quantum superposition rule for flux, and this can be understood by the fact that the experimental fact that we see that the flux uh, is quantized in the superconducting ring. If you measure the flux uh, indicated here in purple, uh, in, in, if that is trapped in a superconducting ring, you will find that the flux is uh, 
quantized in, in uh, unit uh, or sorry, integer multiples, n is an integer of Planck's constant divided by uh, twice the uh, electron charge because we uh, he are dealing here with Cooper pairs going around the ring. And this leads to a metastability, very important kind of uh, uh, stability called metastability of the supercurrents I, which are circulating around the inner perimeter of the ring. And this is, uh, this leads to uh, a persistent current. And we know that once you start a supercurrent going around a circle like this, it persists uh, and it doesn't decay. And the, uh, there have been experiments showing that the decay time of these superconducting rings, as long as they're kept cold, they, they uh, keep on flowing um, uh, and the decay times are longer than the age of the universe. So they really are metastable. And uh, so these persistent currents, the persistent current and the magnetic flux are forbidden to change with time. Once you prepare the system in a certain uh, quantum uh, 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 flux, uh, flux quantization state, and you have the accompanying persistent currents, they do not change with time. So that's another very important um, quantum mechanical uh, constraint on the interaction of gravitational waves with these quantum systems. I, I, I think that uh, it will uh, be clear shortly that this leads to a Meissner-like expulsion of the gravitational wave fields uh, uh, and that this follows from the quantum superselection rule. But in order to show this, let us uh, do the following. Let us imagine we first turn off the gravitational wave so we're just in flat space-time, nothing unusual uh, uh, from the gravitational wave happens. And we know that the standard minimal coupling rule, uh, which was discovered, uh, discussed by Nathan in his talk, but this is the simple uh, flash space version. The canonical momentum is replaced by the canonical momentum minus the charge times the vector potential. Um, the charge here is the charge of the Cooper pair twice the electron charge. This Minimal coupling rule uh, uh, implies uh, that the there's a well the single valueness of the wave function implies that the phase of the wave function after one round trip uh, say around the inner uh, or outer perimeter of the ring is two pi n where n is again an exact integer and uh, using this minimal coupling rule, uh, we get the aharonoff bohm phase, which is that the charge divided by h bar uh, integrating the uh, vector potential, which is, as uh, Aharonoff and Bohm pointed out, a real physical quantity uh, around the closed loop. This uh, can be measured, and, and in fact, it has a physical meaning. It's the flux, and the flux uh, is has to be quantized as a result of the single valueness of the wave function. That is, that the phase comes back uh, uh, to its original uh, value, or, or uh, uh, two pi times n times uh, uh, well, the, a module of this uh, two pi factor. It it, it leads to a uh, quantization of the flux, which works out to be n times h over q or n times h over 2e. This is the fundamental flux quantum. And the important point here is that the flux is a constant of the motion and does not change when uh, we apply the gravitational wave. Supposing that the gravitation, well, now we turn on the gravitational wave. Supposing that gravitational wave is coming in to, towards the system, 
we take a snapshot of it, there is a uh, tidal field uh, associated with the wave. Uh, I note, denote it by G, uh, which is an acceleration field similar to that of the Earth's field. And uh, however, they are pointing uh, to this common center uh, here at the middle. And uh, you would think that the, these uh, acceleration fields would accelerate the, the, uh, the Cooper pairs uh, so that they would uh, move faster. And therefore, the persistent current should increase uh, momentarily when the, you apply these G fields to them. But this is impossible because the quantum super selection rule says, no, that can't happen because the, uh, these currents are constant, uh, persistent currents, and the flux cannot be changed either. So this cannot happen. So what's going to happen if um, the gravitational wave comes in? It's going to uh, be, uh, uh, well, well, this we'll see this. It will, they will be expelled from the uh, this ring system, and we can see this by applying the minimal coupling rule before and after the turn on of gravitational waves at t equals zero. So before the turn on, we we have the usual uh, minimal coupling rule. Uh, the canonical momentum is replaced by the canonical momentum minus Q times the vector potential before they turn on. But after the turn on, and this was shown uh, by uh, Nathan in his slides, uh, one particular term enters in, namely this one, uh, to alter um, the uh, vector potential. If there is a strain of space Hij, which is the deviation of the metric away from flat spacetime metric, and it is contracted <coughs> with the vector potential and modifies the vector potential in this way. Uh, uh, that's the action of the uh, gravitational wave upon uh, the system. <coughs> so the strain of space alters the canonical momentum after the turn on of uh, the uh, wave. And this, uh, want, uh, as I said, the, the gravitational wave wants to change the, uh, or accelerate or uh, increase the persistent currents. And it, its effect is uh, 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 shown into uh, this term, this extra term, which mo uh, modifies the vector potential, namely strain of space, Hij contracted into the vector potential. But notice that the vector potential A is a constant of emotion because of the quantization of flux. But uh, by contrast, the strain of space is uh, varying with time sinusoidally. And uh, so, <clears throat> But we can just do the math here. We uh, first do the first term, and we remind ourselves <clears throat> that it cannot change with time. So it must be uh, t uh, equal to its initial prepared value, which is 2 pi n for this first term, uh, the integral of the vector potential over the closed path. But the second term is there to trying to change it. Uh, so we get, uh, <clears throat> uh, we can solve uh, this as an integral equation. We see that the two pi n's cancel out. <clears throat> We're left with an integral equation, which is that the charge divided by Planck's constant times the closed path integral of <clears throat> the strain Hij, uh, which is a function of time, uh, contracted with the uh, uh, vector potential, uh, which is a constant of the motion, uh, must be zero. Well, the only way you can get a solution is to uh, abide, uh, 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 apply a condition on the strain field of the 
a gravitational wave, namely that Hij of t is zero everywhere on C in order to satisfy this integral equation. So we are uh, we come to the conclusion that quantum select super selection rule leads to a no a no boundary condition on the gravitational wave. This imposes what I call hard wall boundary conditions upon the gravitational wave that leads to hard wall scattering. And the, uh, another way of stating this is that the single valueness of the wave function in one round trip around the ring leads to periodic boundary conditions uh, where the wave function, for example, for the inner, uh, 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 inner perimeter, so S is the uh, arc length along the inner perimeter. And after one round trip, you get uh, two pi A, A is the inner radius. And that uh, wave function must reproduce itself exactly after one round trip. And this is a, a periodic boundary condition, very similar to one that uh, we know from solid state physics, namely the born von Karman boundary condition. For, for crystal lattices. Uh, this boundary condition leads to the first Mi resonance for a radially polarized gravitational wave. And so uh, here uh, is the, a picture of the first Mi resonance for gravitational waves. Supposing we have a gravitational wave, and again, the G field must point normal to the surface locally, uh, say at this point, and supposing the wave is going around clockwise. So again, as it goes around, uh, it must re come back in phase with itself. And that means that the uh, perimeter two pi uh, B, the circumference is equal to one wavelength. And similarly for the inner uh, perimeter, there's another uh, uh, me resonance, two pi a is equal to lambda prime. So we have uh, the same kind of me resonance for gravitational waves as for electromagnetic waves due to these boundary, periodic boundary conditions. So this is a summary of the periodic boundary conditions for the wave functions. And the again, uh, <laughs> uh, periodic boundary conditions do not depend on any coupling constants. In particular, notice that Einstein's coupling constants does not appear in these uh, boundary conditions. And that, uh, again, leads to a Mi resonance scattering cross sections for gra gravitational wave scattering off the, uh, these rings, which is, uh, uh, again, purely geometrical, six pi a squared for the inner uh, scattering and six by B squared for the outer scattering cross section. And again, this is independent of Einstein's coupling constants. They are purely, uh, purely uh, geometrical coupling constants. And so uh, I, I run a little bit over time. So let me conclude my, with my conclusions. Uh, the first one is that an incident gravitational wave is expelled expelled in a Eisner-like expulsion from the pair of charged levitated uh, gravitation, uh, uh, superconducting rings. A quantum super selection rule for, forbids, forbids uh, any time varying changes in the flux quantization of these rings caused by the gravitational wave passing by over the rings. Uh, the, there are periodic boundary conditions that uh, uh, lead to me resonance scatterings, uh, resonance, re resonances, the uh, first me resonance occurs in gravitational wave scattering due to the resulting quantum mechanical, uh, and this results in hard wall boundary conditions. And uh, that a dynamical critical chacality condition ensures that equal amounts of gravitational and electromagnetic wave powers will be emitted by the pairs of rings. And therefore, transduction between electromagnetic and gravitational waves
becomes possible. And therefore, a Herbst-like experiment for the gravita gravitational wave uh, uh, radiation becomes possible. Uh, but this is potentially revolutionary because this will open up trans-Earth communication uh, because of the transparency of the Earth to gravitational waves. And this would obviate the need for communication satellites. And in case there is anyone listening from uh, DARPA, there is, of course, uh, obvious military uh, application of all of this is that we can now communicate with nuclear submarines under the oceans as well. They're submerged in the uh, deep in the oceans by means of uh, this new communications channel via uh, gravitational radiation. And with that, I, I stop uh, and I, uh, I'll, uh, I'm open for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Ray, for uh, your very creative work and very clear presentation of, of your thoughts and, and results. Um, I, I, I had a couple of questions. One is, I, I wasn't quite clear why the rings needed to be levitated. Could they be superconducting rings on a surface? Oh, that's an excellent question. I forgot to mention. They have to be levitated for uh, the same reason that uh, in LIGO, the mirrors are, are uh, suspended uh, as pendula, so they're free to move, OK? It, it, it's very important that the uh, rings are free bodies, OK? Uh, just like the mirrors of LIGO have right. to be free bodies in order to respond, be able to respond to the gravitational radiation. So the uh, short answer is uh, they're levitated because they have to be free bodies. I see, yes. So, you know, previously you had talked about, uh, you know, a rigid wave function in a superconductor and the fact that that rigid wave function couldn't be disturbed, which I think is what a hard wall is, is what you're thinking about now. Um, so, but I think, so rather than the gravity wave disturbing the Cooper pairs inside a superconductor, now, now based on Nathan's work, where, you know, there's no coupling there, uh, now you're using that. And then the motion of the rings and the fact that the gravity waves have to be excluded from the rings. Am I, am I is that an accurate reflection of the idea? Right. Uh, yeah. The, my earlier uh, work uh, was based on the idea of uh, the rigidity of the wave function. Actually, that's an idea that goes back to London in his book on, on superconductors and superfluids. But uh, my current were, uh, ideas are uh, um, uh, uh, slightly different in that uh, I'm looking at periodic boundary conditions, okay, R uh, which are rigid. So uh, it's the rigidity of the wave function taken to another level, if you like. I see. Which, uh, if you have a hole in the middle of your ring, uh, that introduces uh, the possibility of periodic boundary conditions. And I think it's really the periodicity that is really important for uh, imposing uh, constraints on the gravitational waves. Uh, that, that's my present thinking. Yes. Are, are you familiar? I just wanted to mention the work of Carver Mead in Collective Electrodynamics, where he uses uh, the single value nature of a persistent current in a superconducting loop to derive uh, electromagnetics and quantum mechanics. I, I don't know if you're familiar. He has a nice little book on that, but um, oh, you know, he, no, yeah. I, I, I'm, I wasn't aware of that uh, work. Uh, yeah. How do you spell the name? It's Carver Mead, C-A-R-V-E-R -E Mead, M-E-A-D. He's uh, from Caltech. He's a professor at Caltech. Oh, that's very interesting. Yes. Uh, could you send me a reference? Yes, I certainly will. Yes. No, that's uh, that's very similar to my thoughts here, except 
uh, it sounds like he's doing it at a much more fundamental level in that he's uh, deriving the field equations from the boundary conditions. Right, that's that's what he's doing. He, he you oh, know, he, he makes a couple of simple assumptions, you know, the uh, Planck, um, Planck, <laughs> you know, K equals, uh, anyway, the Planck and the, the Einstein, the Planck-Einstein relation, and then just the single valued nature of the persistent current, which he, you know, is a macro quantum state. And then by using that, he can uh, go on and derive electromagnetics and then quantum behavior, including things that look like jumps, you know, that look like quantum jumps, but they're actually um, kind of exponential transitions. So oh. it's very, yeah, very interesting. I, I will pass on that info. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh -huh. No, I was not aware of that work. Yeah, I think uh, Nathan has a question or comment. I do, thank you, Charles. But you know what? I think I'll default to others first because I get opportunities to chat with Ray outside this meeting. So I'll go last, I'll voluntarily go last if others have questions. Yes, yeah, so, well, you were the one with the hand raised. I'm not sure if anyone else has questions at this time. There is. Yeah, yeah I still had my question, Charles. Uh, you know, Ray, it seemed like from your initial slides, I. Uh, talking about the transduction and the time reversibility, I couldn't see why the superconductivity was important. Um, is it is it in the the flux conservation stuff that you developed at the end of your talk? Um, uh, that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, the, the time reversal symmetry argument is uh, uh, sort of. Uh, at a different level of uh, the description of the construction process, uh, the uh, what is uh, missing though uh, from the uh, time uh, ver reversal arguments are the uh, detailed uh, considerations of uh, the cross sections and. Uh, uh, conversion efficiencies, but uh, uh, you are right. The, the time reversal arguments, uh, for example, do, uh, don't take into account the superconducting uh, elements in, in this scheme here. So uh, you might ask, well, why, why don't you use something uh, that is not superconducting to uh, do this transduction? Well, uh, I think that the uh, these other considerations which I, I introduced, uh, namely the quantum super selection rule and the periodic boundary conditions uh, uh, indicate that we really need to consider, uh, uh, well, basically the single valuedness of the wave function of the superconductor that, 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 that is important in, in getting to the me resonance results that I, I mentioned towards the end of my talk. So uh, yeah, I think that quantum mechanics is important. In fact, uh, I made a, a joke uh, on one uh, annotations that this is uh, uh, in, uh, well, uh, it, there's a note, uh, I just say it, uh, that in the battle between uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity, uh, I believe that quantum mechanics wins. In other words, if you have uh, to choose between quantum mechanics and relativity, as far as uh, experimental results uh, are concerned, I would bet, I mean, this is just my personal opinion, that quantum mechanics supersedes uh, uh, all general relativity. And this um, is really important, for example, in, in this idea of the gravitational wave uh, uh, hitting a hard wall when it comes to the uh, uh, superconducting rings. So uh, uh, general relativity uh, or gravitational wave 
hits a hard wall when it comes to uh, quantum mechanics uh, uh, coming into this problem. Uh, this this is, a, of course, a speculation on my part. It's a conjecture, uh, and it has to be checked by experiment. Uh, we'll have to see who, which uh, which way should we, uh, which is more uh, correct, uh, quantum mechanics or general relativity. Okay, thanks, Ray. Thank you. Yeah, Sam, you had a question or comment? Yeah, hi, this is Sam. Um, I love the talk and, um, and thank you. Uh, so I'm, Charles and I are, are longtime friends um, from when I was a Navy guy, uh, but I was, a, I was a civil servant down in the CTO's office down at Pax River. And there was an expressed interest in the last bullet you have here around um, based off of the approaches that you're talking about. So well, my question is, is um, are we, are you, or can we, if you aren't um, working with ONR on this topic to help you get further for that outcome specifically, um, uh, improving communications? Um, um, no, I, I, I would be very interested. I, I'm looking for funding actually. Yeah, for, okay. That's and, where I'm uh, going with it, is I can uh, find a sponsor you know, I, for you. I would love to get some funding from ONR, but okay. uh, let, let me just give you my history a little bit. I, for a long time, I was uh, funded by ONR through a guy named Hirsch Pilaf. Uh, Hirsch, though, retired, and then I lost my funding. And uh, with it, I, my ONR uh, fund, uh, well, anyway, my funding stopped. And, and, uh, and so I, I have lost touch with um, ONR and I, I would love to reestablish that connection. Okay. I will take that action, Charles, if you could connect us. Sure. We're gonna um, put a gentleman that I, um, who is very intimately familiar and um, he doesn't, he is obsessed with the idea, but he's not a quantum physicist. He's an aerospace engineer like me. And, um, and uh, down at Pax River, his name is Todd Parcell. And he and I used to work in the- Did uh, you spell his name, uh, Sam? Yes, it's Todd Parcell. Um, he's down at Pax River. How do you and, spell uh, Parcell? I, I'll put it in the chat, the chat. Oh. Um, and he used to be my boss down at Pax River. Um, and then the other individual that I'm going to put you in touch with is uh, Chris Marsh. He's at ONR. Oh, uh huh. So those two. So one, you know, Chris will have money, and Todd will have the requirement, uh -huh. and the two have to kind of go together. Um, okay. And there's another individual. I don't know if he's if he's retired yet. His name is Jerry Rabinsky, who does the basic and applied research bar um monies that um you know would would integrate this into navy oh uh -huh. if you want to yeah. do some experiments and things like that so so as a this call to action uh, thank you, you so much sam for absolutely this. yeah this is super important work and um and if we can show something like that i think um from a concept of believability that people are seeing that this is a real thing um in the general area of quantum um, has application to today's war fighting, then more money will flow. So, oh, well, that would, would be great because, you know, after I, I left Berkeley, um, I've been really having a really hard time uh, getting funding for my research. Um, okay. And so, this especially would be important for not only me, but for uh, the university at Mer California at Merced uh, generally, and, and in particular, my colleague, uh, Jay Sharping, who is the real experimentalist uh, on the team. Yeah, yeah, he's been also struggling to get uh, our, our, our lab going, especially uh, since uh, I have two dilution refrigerators, which are uh, getting old at this point. I, I bought them when I moved to uh, UC Merced 10 years ago, and uh, they're beginning to uh, show their age, let's put it that way. And so uh, it's uh, we're even getting 
uh, we need some money even just to maintain our dilution refrigerators and keep them going. Yeah, yeah we'll put together, um, we'll work offline and we'll try and put together something. Yeah. Um, those individuals. So, well, thank you so much. That's a really valuable uh, connection. No, you, yeah, you, your work is valuable and I see yeah. it. So. And then, you know, we can also bring that up with uh, the CNR as well. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. how far his influence actually goes down into the, the trenches. But, uh, you know, we'll do that as well. Chris Marshevsky works for Selby, um, but he's in, I think he's in the transformational funding group. So. Okay. Sam, could you spell that name? I, 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 all these names are not yes. familiar to me. I'll, yeah. send the, I'll send them in an email to you just right away. How is oh, that? Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. They're also in the chat. Right. Thank you for your time and thank you for letting me share. Okay, any other uh, comments for Ray? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. I, I have to raise my hand in this way because the icon for raising the hand is actually disappeared from my, from my, um, for my computer. I don't know why. But yes. Uh, I would like to point out to the, our, to the ethical aspect of this revolutionary uh, work that they had wonderful revolutionary work that has been done. I was also considering um, interested for this. Uh, information channel that um, that I uh, uh, first time I heard about uh, gravitational waves uh, waves uh, waves a um, couple of years ago so um, um, do we uh, we as a scientist we have this responsibility for the peace on in this world for me raises the question if we can give this, uh, this uh, possibility for military industrial complex. When we uh, look at the situation in this planet, what is going on? What, uh, how uh, little influence we have for the situation of this 80 richest uh, persons in this, on this planet that own uh, the half of this, what is of the um, of this what is uh, possible to own on this um, on this planet they have no um, no uh, respect for the for the persons for the people in this they are depopulate the, uh, this uh, this um, this planet so uh, i'd like to only point out to consider if if it is not too late if the milk is not already spilled out. So let's, let's take, uh, talk about our responsibility. If we uh, want to give this we weapon to, to the military. Right, you know, so that, that's always a real dilemma. It's a really dilemma. Right, right. and so, you know, we are, we are trying to do things for the good of everybody and the planet and the yes. biome. That is our objective. Um, you know, and I, I did work at the Lockheed Skunk Works, right? So I, I worked for a defense company and I always felt like the work we were doing were, was preventing wars because given what we had, you know, that, that was sort of the way I, I rationalized it. And you know, it's, it's like everything we develop, uh, there's going to be good uses and bad uses. And I don't know how right. to prevent, I don't know how to prevent that. Right. So, you know, if we, if we say Ray didn't take money from O&R, but had some uh, philotrop, you know, some uh, donation that enabled him to do the experiment and then he published the work, you know, in open literature, well, there it is out there for people to use for good or to use for bad. And so what a dilemma. I'm not sure what to do about that. You know, yeah. we, you know, I, I think that, um, 
There is a no. pro uh, human being problem. A couple of years ago, I had a whistleblower. Actually, it was a whistleblower uh, lecture from German uh, professor for um, uh, for psychology. His name is uh, uh, Rainer Mausfeld, and he uh, gave the lecture um, for students about why do the sleep uh, the sheep sleep the sheep we are, that's are we we are the ships so um and he pointed out that the human being at it could be also um uh, it was very exactly with, um uh scientifically uh, um 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 researched so already siblings have this double moral you know the positive morality and negative i think so and it is be it's possible um every moment to switch between one or on another so we are as a human beings in our character and our spirit we have a devil and angel in us so this is really a point of being spiritual stable to um for all the people on this planet to to uh, not to gain engage in global war again so this is very a uh, great responsibility for uh, um, for us yes well but again, you know, so if we, you know, humans, if, if we can make something happen, we're, you know, like create something and generate an effect, yeah. we're going to do that. <laughs> uh, I may interject, yeah, I uh, agree with Jacek, um, but I think uh, in the, uh, that we need a feasible um, answer to this kind of thing. That it ultimately comes down to us, uh, people in the sciences, that we have to uh, be be careful and not uh, develop some of this. Um, uh, during the Manhattan Project, uh, several of the people working on it weren't uh, directly aware of what they were working on. Uh, so I think it's just something that we have to be careful about because obviously we all want uh, to have a peaceful wor world that's not on the brink of destruction and all that. Yes. Right. My, my idea would be to, to uh, just to, to do that, uh, to do it and make in instantly open open source project for the whole humanity yes so that's you know public, publishing the results in open literature which is what the o and r you know everything they sponsor is basic research that gets published right so, yeah so that that would be the you know with publish the results so i don't know i, I haven't let ray uh Ray, do you have a comment on this discussion? Uh, yes, I, I would say that uh, my particular uh, take on this kind of uh, result is that uh, uh, communications generally is uh, beneficial to humanity rather than uh, uh, negative. Uh, for example, uh, I would say that uh, in nuclear uh, bomb research, uh, like in the Manhattan Pro Project, is clearly uh, much more negative than what uh, I'm working on, because uh, communications will bring humanity closer together, especially global communication. Uh -huh. And um, I, I, I think that that outweighs the uh, negative aspects uh, that uh, are associated with nuclear weapons, for example. Yeah, so that's a beautiful thought, I like that. The important thing is to, uh, to the manner we, we, how we do it, right? Yes, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah. but I, I agree that it should be totally in the open literature 
and that uh, that that helps a lot to, if we uh, make sure that none of this research is classified. Right. Right. Charles, are we out of time for technical? No, questions? no, not at all. Please go ahead. Oh, I don't mean to derail the conversation because no, I don't no, no, really please. important. Yeah. And I know ethical and philosophical considerations like this very, very much matter. I just want to take advantage of the time we have with Ray. Um, and he just presented a great talk with a lot of great content. And I hope, and why, whereas this conversation could, of course, occur at the end of literally probably anybody's talk, I guess. <laughs> Um, but I know we're out of time uh, technically on the schedule, or do we have a few more minutes to- Yeah, sure, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Great, um, by the way, I wanted to just comment real quick. Charles, you asked a great question about, do these uh, superconducting rings need to be levitated and Ray brought up about the sensitivity associated with LIGO and such. I, I did wonder about that real quick, Ray. Um, in this particular case, uh, if I understand right, we're not using those rings or objects objects in general to generate the gravitational waves uh, or, or to detect them. In other words, the center of mass motion of those rings is not playing a role here, right? Right, uh, it's the relative uh, displacement between them that's important. Uh, in your language, it's the geodesic deviation equation of motion, which is involved in the radiation of uh, gravitational radiation. Okay, well, I noticed in the talk, it was all centered on the boundary conditions associated with the surface of the ring, for instance, like those me resonance conditions were associated with the perimeter uh, mm -hmm. having to be equal to a wavelength. So I gathered from the talk that it, there's no motion of those rings themselves. It's the boundary conditions on the surfaces of those rings. Is that true? Uh, well, uh, for... <laughs> That's a start, but but uh, the gravitational wave interacts with both rings symmetrically, as you know, because it's a quadrupolar uh, wave, and therefore um, you have to uh, consider the uh, com combination, the symmetric combination of the two rings, and there are uh, um, symmetric me resonances that are involved in the. Um, uh, in the scattering cross-section of the gravitational wave. One ring by itself won't scatter uh, gravitational wave. You need a pair of them uh, moving, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in an anti-symmetric fashion against the center of mass. And so, uh, yeah, so my, my talk, uh, uh, focused only on, um, uh, yeah, you're right, uh, uh, on a single ring, but but uh, one has to be careful to uh, consider a pair of rings interacting with uh, uh, the gravitational wave such that uh, the motions are, um, uh, with respect to a center of mass of the system, of even for the considerations of the me resonance. So I, uh, what, what, I, what I presented was an oversimplification, if you like. I see. I definitely agree with the need for the symmetry that you just described, that we'd have to have two rings for sure. I was just trying to think, experimentally speaking, um, Charles is bringing up a good point that levitating them of course, introduces a bit more technical complication to the experiment. And so I wondered, based on everything you presented, is there any point in the um, analysis where the rings would in fact need to be levitated so as to move freely without any other uh, perturbation to the system? Or could you in principle have these two rings sitting on a tabletop type experiment and generate the me resonance, resonances in them and, uh, and generate the effects you're talking about without the need for those rings themselves to move. And therefore we wouldn't care if they were levitated. Uh, my, I, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. My intuition is that, uh, well, let's put it this way. Certainly if you uh, levitated both rings and made them free to move, then that's a much cleaner situation uh, that uh, clearly allows coupling to uh, the gravitational waves uh, via the uh, geodesic deviation equations of motion 
because they are free to move, both of them. And so uh, it's just a lot simpler to levitate. And that's what we're doing is it's levitating both rings. It just simplifies the, uh, the, the physics. And what is the inertia of the masses of two rings? Sorry, could you repeat your question, Jason? What is about inertia of these masses of these uh, rings? Um, I think by uh, these high frequencies of these waves, it, it wouldn't be possible for these rings to 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 uh, to move. Well, that... it, it would be uh, rather the space that would be shrinked and, and oh yes. Both, yes, right? that's right. You are right, Jacek, that it's a space which is being expanded yeah. and, and contracted or squeezed oh, yeah. and, and stretched uh, uh, between the rings. But that uh, has a consequence that the rings move toward each other and away from each other. And that uh, motion, that the relative motion is described uh, uh, in the language of uh, general relativity by uh, the geodesic deviation, deviation equation of motion, okay? And so that is the equation of motion which uh, Naislin has been looking at in respect to the uh, problem of interaction of the uh, matter with uh, gravitational radiation. And I think that's the sa same approach which I've been taking here. I, I think I can also comment on that for you, JSEC, by the way, if you think about it mathematically, uh, when we're talking about gravitational forces or even geodesic deviation between two objects, the inertial mass, because it's equivalent to the gravitational mass in you know standard general relativity with the equivalence principle, it won't play a role. Unlike if you had electromagnetic forces, then the inertia plays a role in the equation of motion and um, the the role of inertia would matter how heavy these rings would matter but in the case of gravity as you know mathematically it's going to cancel in the equation of motion um by the way ray can we go back to an earlier slide where you had the quantization of the flux uh, in terms of integer values um i think this is something i may have asked you about before but maybe i'll ask it now again because we have of course more eyes looking at this and so we could take advantage um, if you back up to where uh, you have the integer uh, quantization of the uh, flux, and yeah, that's probably, I think, arguably one of your most important slides, because this is where you are saying that the gravitational wave is zeroed out, and that's why you then argue from there, if I understand right, that you could have reflection and so forth. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wondered about this here. Uh, you might recall, Ray, this won't be new to you when I make this comment, but again, I think it could be helpful as a conversation. I wondered, uh, in those equations that you have there, uh, if you require n to keep the same value uh, and you turn on the gravitational wave, then I agree that the result you have there is that the gravitational wave, which is contracted with the vector potential in that line integral, has to give you a zero result there to preserve the value of n. But I wondered why can't the value of n change when you introduce the gravitational wave, which would then mean that we don't need to zero out the gravitational wave. Instead, the superconductor would permit a phase with a higher integer value. Do you follow what I mean? Yes, I, 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 uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me answer it this way that N is, uh, uh, well, it's, it's related to the metastability. Uh, in other words, what you uh, say about the change in N in general, uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, it can be allowed, it's called transitions, right? You can go from N to N prime, to where N prime says N plus one or N minus one. But right. uh, this is highly forbidden uh, because of the metastability of these uh, persistent currents and uh, the quantized uh, flux. In other words, it's very, very hard for N to change. Uh, and uh, uh, specifically, the reason for that is this, that there are extremely high energy barriers between the different values of N, so high that 
for all practical purposes, uh, uh, these uh, n, n values are in different, uh, what the theorists call super selection sectors. Sectors are uh, uh, where n is, is a constant of motion for all practical purposes because you can't change n from one value to another. Does that help? Oh, it helps tremendously. I wonder if we could quantify the uh, the these sectors so as to then put um, clear quantifiable boundaries on this model. In other words, for instance, the gravitational wave could only have a particular frequency or amplitude uh, while maintaining the same value of n. And in that sector, you could expect the expulsion or reflection of the gravitational yeah. wave. Would that be possible? So you're asking how much it would take to change the single valued nature of the wave function. Oh, actually, Charles, I want to keep the single valued nature on the left side, that delta phi, but I want, but I'm talking about if that n value on the right side were to change, then it would allow that extra integral that he has there that he set to zero yeah, to but comp it, it, compensate each other. And that would keep delta phi the same on the left. You follow what I mean? Right, yeah. So, but, so I'm hmm. preserving, I'm still preserving the single valuedness of the wave function because that's what leads us to having integer values at all. I'm only saying, why can't we bump up in integer values? And as Ray mentioned, it's what we would call like a transition or a quantum transition. And so what Ray is saying is, not only are we gonna keep the single valuedness of the wave function on the left, but we're also going to lock the n value on the right. And so before we turn on the gravitational wave, the vector potential, the A there, is already telling us what n has to be. So then Ray argues when you bring in the gravitational wave, everything's locked. And so the only choice left for us is that the term with the gravitational wave has to be made zero because all other terms are locked in, in place. That's that's the idea, I believe. In principle, uh, Nathan, what you say is true, that there, there can be a transition, uh, a quantum transition to a different value of n when you turn on the gravitational wave uh, compared to when, uh, before and after. But uh, how to quantify that uh, requires uh, some analysis, which I, I, I don't know how to do. Um, and and I, uh, I don't know if there's some literature on this or not, but, but my, my gut feeling is that it, these quantum uh, uh, transitions are highly forbidden. In other words, it goes back to this super selection rule idea that basically tra quantum transitions between different values of n are are highly forbidden yeah that would be probably a really great extension for this research for us um because in my mind at least that's the most debated aspect of what we have here and, and may i ask, add a footnote to that i think that uh, the best way to answer this question actually is to do uh, some experiments yes I agree with that. You know, the challenge of those gravitational waves are so weak that it makes it hard to know whether effects that you're seeing are, I mean, what would you be looking for, for example, tangibly? Well, uh, it, it's a catch-22 situation in that um, uh, since gravitational waves are so hard to generate and to detect, uh, the experiments will be hard uh, to do uh, unless you have a source and a detector for them. And so uh, um, it, we have to do the experiments, uh, uh, I don't know, in some order, but uh, I, I suspect we have to try the Hertz-like experiment first to see if we can uh, generate gravitational waves in the a new way and then use those gravitational waves like in optics to see if uh, you can make a mirror or, or a scatter a hard wall boundary conditions that follow from these quantum super selection rules that comes later, it seems to me. 
<laughs> well, if we were to just brainstorm on the fly, I imagine, for example, we know that even if we just wave our hands like this, technically we're generating gravitational waves that are radiating out, right? As long as you have some quadrupole motion of mass, you're generating gravitational waves. So say, for instance, hypothetically, you were to be in a lab and you were to have the device that you have here, the, the EMGR transducing device, and someone were to stand in front of it um, and wave their hands, they would be generating gravitational waves that this device should, in principle, be able to then transduce into electromagnetic waves, for instance, and then those electromagnetic waves should be detectable in, in standard ways. Is that true? Yes, uh -huh. yes. And, uh, 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 but the, the problem is that the waves that are generated by your, the motion of your fists is so tiny that uh, it's not a very practical experiment. I think a better experiment is to look for the primordial uh, gravitational analog of the CME, the cosmic bi microwave background using a transducer. Yeah, because that, getting... that's always present. Yes, exactly. And so I think that 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 would be a better experiment than. Is it stronger? I I don't know order of magnitude wise what the amplitude of. Uh, well, the, you have to look at the numbers maybe. Yeah, the that's a really good point. Um, we don't know the answer to how strong the uh, gravitational uh, wave component of the cosmic microwave background is. If you look in the literature, and I've, I've done this a little bit, there are uh, different theories as to how strong it should be, but um, uh, that, that, that's another whole uh, different issue, which uh, I, I, I think is uh, um, scientific research on its own, which, which uh, but this, if uh, we can make a transducer, it would, uh, it would be able to detect these waves. And if, uh, oh, if it is on the same order as the electromagnetic uh, uh, cosmic microwave background, which we know we can detect because the temperature, the equivalent temperature is around three Kelvin. And so if the cosmic microwave background happened to be around a few Kelvin, just say, uh, then we uh, would be able to transduce it to electromagnetic waves of a few Kelvin, and that's easy to do. So uh, that's a fairly easy experiment. Uh, but the, even that takes a lot of work, though. Well, that and like, I, if I understand right, the CMB analog for gravitational waves, the gravitational wave background that we have from Big Bang, uh, is, I think, uh, dependent on the cosmological model that one is looking at. And so I feel like there's a little bit of a house of cards there because are you proving the correct cosmological model or are you trying to oh. detect gravitational waves in the lab? So wouldn't the Hertz-like experiment be the way to go using I, EM to generate a gravitational wave and that through time reversal, the other ring will detect that same gravitational wave since it was generated in the ring and then generate an EM signal based on that. I agree so it seems with that. to me that Hertz-like experiment in the Faraday cages gets away from, you know, where do you get the gravitational wave from? I agree. And you'll know the signature of the wave. Like you will be determining the frequency, the amplitude, you would have control. Because when I wave my fists, I know what frequency I'm doing that at. And I know how much mass I'm waving. So I know mathematically from Einstein's general relativity exactly what gravitational wave is coming in. And I can look for that. Kind of well, like I go I'm saying at. use the, you know, use the EM into the ring, the dual rings that will generate a gravity wave. And then, you know, since the, the system was able to generate that gravity wave by, um, you know, time reversal symmetry, the other set of rings would be able to detect that same gravitational wave, whatever it was, you know, um, whatever value. Does that make sense? Uh, do you think, Ray? Yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I actually agree with you that I think 
if I were to choose between uh, looking for the cosmic microwave background in gravitational waves and the Hertz-like experiment, I would uh, vote for doing the Hertz-like experiment first. Yes. Agreed. So this would basically just be a matter of uh, setting up this apparatus. You know, again, of course, we know it goes back to funding and such. Um, and then seeing what happens. It's just, I guess, from a theorist's point of view, which is what obviously my tends to be my focus, I still would like to resolve this issue of uh, the rigidity, if you will, of this n value. And I'd like to nail down mathematically. Right, right. I, I thought I had a reference on that, but I couldn't find it right away as we sit here. So I will try to find that and pass that along. Um, I've seen that somewhere. But that's a great question, Nathan. You know, so it really kind of the chart that's up right now is really, you know, that's the acid test or that's the key linchpin there. It is right, right there. It is. Yes. So, but it, it's a beautiful experiment and idea to go off and go try. I mean, the, the impact is so significant. You know, shoot, if I was a program manager at DARPA or something, I would do this. <laughs> and I don't think it's that expensive. In the nah, light of I don't know about that, Nathan. I, I, I disagree. Oh. Because, you know, now we're talking about uh, maintaining the superconductivity, mm. uh, right? We're talking about having them levitated. Uh, I don't know what sort of interference effects there'll be with the uh, levitation. You know, he used to, uh, you have to do some ion implantation into the superconducting material. That's right. Um, to make the rings, uh, probably you need to really make sure they're very similar uh, in order for the time reversal to act uh, the same. So there might yeah, be the spatial some symmetry. Yeah, the spatial yeah, the symmetry. Spatial the weight yeah. symmetry as well. So you'd have to take some care in making these things. So I don't think it's exactly a cheap experiment. Um, I don't know, Ray, what do you, do you agree with that? That's no, I, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, I, I have learned from hard experience that what seems so simple at first always turns out <laughs> to be more complicated. And, and so uh, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Charles. It, it, it's, uh, there are, it, it has to be considered carefully. And yes. Detailed. Well, all the more reason for us to do our theory homework then, because that's not as expensive, I guess, besides man hours, right? <laughs> yeah, but the theory, you know, so theory uh, can be debated, especially these things that have not had experimental uh, validation of the theory, right? I, so I don't know. I'm with Ray that the really, uh, yeah, the theory is going to guide the experiment and guides the experiment. But the only way to really know, in my mind, and I'm more on the experimental side, I guess, is to do an experiment. <laughs> well, well, why then, like, for instance, with DeWitt having written his paper in 1966, and we've come so far when detecting the gravitomagnetic field already through, you know, astronomical means, uh, why hasn't any of this ever been done in a lab? conclusively at this point you know, i don't know you know uh, there's so many things you know i don't know you can ask all those sort of questions um i mean it's been it, like many decades is what i mean that this has been looked at well i i know that the people at stanford uh well who did the gravity pro b experiment spent you know decades on on just looking for the lens adhering field of the earth and that was a really hard hard experiment and sure. and i think that uh the uh the wit uh, idea of, of you know coupling a superconductor to a gravity um uh, Gravito magnetic field is even harder than that. So, so I, I think that uh, that's why uh, DeWitt's proposal has never been followed up in the lab. It's just very, very, very hard to do. Yeah, and I think we also have a better understanding of uh, quantum phenomena, especially macro-based quantum phenomena now than we did back then in the 60s, I would say. I, I don't know if that's yeah, no, a factor or not. <laughs> 
Um, I'd also like to ask a related um, concept check, uh, concept question here, uh, Ray, which is, um, so in your talk, you mentioned that we can basically evade the presence of kappa, the Einstein constant that appears in his field equation, and that's the real key to us being able to make progress with gravitational wave communication and such. I wondered if we were to do an analogous calculation in the context of electromagnetism, can we demonstrate that a Hertz-like experiment can be done and with a mathematical formalism that doesn't involve the electromagnetic coupling constant, which is analogous to the Einstein coupling constant? I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, as a warm-up problem, like I remember, you know, when I'd work under your under your guidance, you'd give me a warm-up problem, right? So, as a warm-up problem, can <laughs> we show? <laughs> can we show that electromagnetically, there's a Hertz-like um, experiment that can be predicted mathematically that doesn't involve the electromagnetic coupling constant? Because that would be a little more convincing that we can also do that for gravity. Oh, that's a really excellent point, Nathan. Uh, <clears throat> I I have been trying hard to think of uh, what that would be. Uh, I, I need to, I need more time to think about that. That's a, a really important question you've raised. Yeah. Maybe you can help me answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I felt I just signed myself up for something right there. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Jacek, hey, Charles, Jacek has raised his hand. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, Jacek. Um, my question is, uh, the um, parameters of the propagation of, um, of uh, gravitational waves, uh, what is the velocity? And the radiation parameter, is it transversal or, or not? And what is with the interferences with under with other frequencies of it. I, th I can imagine it would be the same, the same thing with, with electromagnetic, um, uh, electromagnetic uh, smog we, we, are, we are thinking. Propagation velo velocity. Are you talking about the speed of the wave itself? Yes. So if this is uh, in air or vacuum, they're actually, gravitational waves are much like electromagnetic waves in that they do propagate at the speed C. Um, and uh, as far as like uh, the transverse versus longitudinal things of that sort, they are transverse waves. The only difference is that because they're tensor waves, they also have this additional characteristic called traceless, which kind of adds some additional mathematical complication. But aside from that, Jacek, I think all of that would look the same for both types of waves. Were you, were, you were you wondering if there would be a distinction that we'd be able to identify or something between GR waves and EM waves that would be relevant here? I think Jacek, you must be muted, or did we lose you? I thought it is not question directed for me to me. Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah, oh, it is. <laughs> um, it depends on you know. Um, um, I would like to uh, look at it at my as a, so to say a spiritual point of view. Buddhistic point of view. Um, according to Buddhism, to Buddhism, we live in uh, there are um, two aspects of um, of the true nature of essence of everything. First of all, is this emptiness, is nothingness. This is one aspect, and the second aspect of this spirit that actually now speaks is an uh, aspect of function. And these functions are unnumerable. We are this true nature. And this is consciousness. So in, in this area, 
there is no time, no space. So, and we are connected with this. Every sentient beings is only one, according to Buddhism, to Buddhism, there's only one consciousness, cosmic consciousness. And it is uh, like waves on the ocean, common uh, to every sentient beings. We are all these sentient beings. And actually on this level, we are one. And this illusion of separation of physics and so on, it separates us. So yet now speaking um, uh, scientifically, uh, we all have a connection to it. So it must be a possibility somewhere in this consciousness, in this consciousness um, and physical world, 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 there is no different, it's two, uh, sides of the, of the same coin. So it would be possible to communicate without um, boundaries of time. These parapsychologic uh, um, experience shows this tele tele telepathy. And this uh, is in, in the quantum uh, in Austria, there was this uh, professor for um, just uh, how I don't know the um, how do I pronounce it this uh, quantum um, when you have it uh, um, two quant uh, two uh, quants they are the same spin and they they are a pair of quants and the um, change in one spin uh, in the one uh, one uh, the one uh, on, the, on this pair is immediately noticed in the another, another one. There's no separation of it. So I suspect the possibility of transmission on the level of consciousness that could be, so to say, physically to be um, used. How? I don't know. I don't mm. know. So yeah. physically, we are also physics, our bodies, our mind, it's the same physics, but we didn't, don't know this part. We, are, we didn't, didn't research it already. So we are speaking only with time propagation. It must be uh, in this uh, one aspect of emptiness. There is no time, no space. This is war. Well, Jacek, you're, you're bringing up a lot of really interesting topics that I don't know we can do justice to in the very, very limited time we have. I mean, to be yes. honest, I mean, they're great topics and I enjoy philosophy tremendously. Um, so, but yeah, and I agree wholeheartedly this, that what you're talking about, Jacek, is where science should be looking and investigating. And I think, uh, you know, we've done a disservice to rule out that sort of discussion and investigation in the hard sciences and yes. relegate it to philosophy and the humanities. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's all non reproducible, right? It's not like, you know, Newton's law where I push my mouse and it does the same thing every single time. These things are elusive. It makes it really hard as scientists to study it. Yes. But, um, you know, I think I agree with everything you said, and it's something that science should tackle and consider. Um, I don't think it's relevant to this gravity experiment, but uh, unless, you, unless you're thinking, well, maybe there's another way of communication, which probably is true, but, uh, you know, that's separate than this gravity uh, transduction experiment. I have just one more technical item, if I may. I don't know if we have time for one. Sure, more. sure. Um, so, Ray, you're using that me resonance um, boundary condition. Uh, I'm not very familiar with how that uh, how that is uh, introduced in like standard textbook electromagnetism or something like that. Uh, but I I wondered 
Uh, in fact, if you want to go over the slide, if it's handy, uh, where you're talking about the mu resonance, uh, particularly you mentioned the way right there, the waves are uh, confined to the boundary of that ring. Uh, it made me wonder, uh, in the context of electromagnetism, is that is that the case when you have a conductor and so there's a skin depth and uh, so electromagnetic waves then have to stay on the surface. Um, the reason I ask that is because if so, it would make me wonder whether we would have to have that material. Yes, yeah, so the material properties definitely enter into how much scattering you actually get, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, scattering is something I happen to know intimately. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, study and we use spheres as calibration right for radar cross-section measurements we because we know the sphere so well and you know the Rayleigh region the my the me region and you know he's talking about the first me which is the highest um but you know it's so that's, 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 so, so that's a question you know i had as well about the material properties entering into the boundary condition yes and, exactly and, and before i forget you know I, I don't this the idea has always intrigued me about the uh conservation in gravity or the boundary condition in gravity having to do with the boundary of the boundary is zero and i, I got that you know from um you know kip thorne's uh, giant gravity book and uh, i guess it's wheeler who thinks in that sort of way but, and I've asked this about the boundary of the boundary is zero. Somehow I think my could enter into this discussion of, you know, how does, how will gravity change? You know, if the boundary of the boundary is zero I, and I, I'm not, um, you know, I don't know enough to talk intelligently about it. Although I just know my gut tells me that boundary of the boundary is zero is somehow important to this. And I just wanted to throw that out there and then let Ray answer the question about the material properties in the, the me resonance. So it's almost like a two part question then I guess maybe Charles, um, yes. if I could suggest that we look at it that way. One part is kind of what I introduced, which is, uh, are we assuming that the superconductor is a material that effectively uh, acts like a gravitational conductor the same way uh, a usual conductor does in response to gravity to electromagnetic waves uh, that would be one and then the second would be the more I, I think extended uh, part of the question of if that's a boundary and there's a boundary of a boundary that's zero does that play a role in these uh, considerations of reflection and things of that sort um, is that about right did I kind of summarize I suppose what we're trying yes. to yes okay so yeah, Ray, do you have any comment on that? Because I, I did wonder if that was assumed here on some level that maybe wasn't explicit. Uh, yes, uh, this is a really uh, important question to you, Ray. So what, <clears throat> what do the material properties, uh, for example, the superconductor in this uh, picture here, uh, let me try and uh, use the laser pointer. <clears throat> The uh, how does the material properties of the superconductor enter into the mu resonance uh, and and this boundary condition of uh, periodic uh, <coughs> the, peri <coughs> the periodic let's see I think it's here periodic boundary conditions how does that affect um, <coughs> and you you are absolutely right I've swept something under the rug when I introduced this. Uh, oversimplified uh, condition for the mean resonance circumference equals one wavelength. That is, after one round trip, uh, <clears throat> the uh, wave uh, reproduces itself exactly. Now, <clears throat> and that bo periodic boundary condition is clearly a, a, a some kind of approximation in which the penetration depth of this wave uh, into the superconductor is vanishingly small, so small that uh, for all practical purposes, we can just idealize it as uh, a periodic boundary condition. 
Uh, well, but this raises a general question uh, for you, Nathan, and that is, where do boundary conditions in general uh, for differential equations are, come from? And, uh, <clears throat> and how, how do, does one incorporate boundary conditions into the field equation, say, of Einstein? And uh, all of this is um, <clears throat> something I've swept under the rug. Uh, but I, I, uh, what I'm saying in terms of the gravitational wave is this, that the gravitational waves uh, behave just like the electromagnetic waves as far as the boundary conditions are concerned, which is a big, big statement and, and has to be looked at more critically, which is, um, uh, well, that the wave function uh, of the supernova has to be single value uh, after a run round, round trip. And that is where it comes from. And, but that is, uh, ha has to be uh, uh, tested experimentally because these boundary conditions are not obvious. And they, they uh, uh, my answer is uh, again, um, these boundary conditions have swept under the rug a lot of physics concerning the material. Yeah, you are right about that, and and and, uh, and the, the best place to, again to look to start a look at the, this problem is look at the electromagnetic case, which is much be better understood than the gravitational wave case. How does the boundary condition here arise in the case of the superconductor, and and that uh, is a better posed question, and um, uh, I think. That even that needs a lot of work to, to really firm up how you formulate the boundary conditions in the case of the first me resonance uh, that's pictured here. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, I think it, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense, and it kind of reminds me of like with waveguides, for instance, that uh, we identify the electromagnetic wave modes that would exist in a waveguide with the assumption that the walls of the waveguide are basically perfect reflectors so that we don't have to even worry about penetration depth and things of that nature. And I suspected, I wasn't sure because I'm not so familiar with me resonances, but I suspected that maybe that type of treatment is what's involved here also, that it's yes, almost you're like absolutely right. It, it, it's the same question in, uh, as in the waveguides. We, we, we're sweeping a lot on the rug when we uh, state these boundary conditions. But uh, maybe I should ask Charles Chase this since he's done evidently some work on me scattering or scattering theory. Um, where do the boundary conditions come from? Yeah, so it's just, uh, you know, it comes into the wave equation of the material properties. Um, and usually you ignore the skin depth. So I am not aware of people <laughs> calculating the cross section of superconducting materials. I, I have not seen that, to be honest. But of a you know of a normal metal material or dielectric material, you know it just enters into the wave equation, and as you would normally enter um, uh, material properties. And generally, we ignore uh, skin depth. I, I think that in the as far as electromagnetic waves interacting with a material, I think conductors and superconductors might basically be on the same footing because they both uh, reflect the the electromagnetic wave uh, with a depth that is extremely small relative to the rest of the bulk of the material. So I think that um, the yeah. So I've never I've never been convinced of that actually, but um, you know maybe you're right. Um, you know, I, I have not been convinced that, you know, if you look at a wave, um, then accelerating an electron in a superconductor versus a metal, you know, do, hmm, I, I, I don't know. It, it just doesn't seem the same to me. I could be wrong, but, you know, if you looked at uh, uh, an accelerating electron generated by the wave, uh, I think it would behave differently in a superconductor. And you're saying, well, they're both reflective. So, but, um, you know, so the, the me resonance uh, comes from the wave going around the body. 
So, you know, then yeah, yeah, I think what it comes down to is the so called equilibriating time, like the time it takes for a conductor to re equilibrate when you introduce a field. And it's so quick for both the normal conductor and the superconductor. You can calculate both, even in Griffiths, like in uh, Griffiths textbook on ENM. Um, he, I think he shows it's like on the order of like nanoseconds or something. And I think that's true for both conductor and superconductor. Uh, what makes the superconductor unique, I believe, and I don't pretend to be an expert at all uh, in superconductivity, but what makes it unique is that you can have a DC field, like a DC magnetic field expelled, uh, and that introduces the Meissner effect, which doesn't exist with the regular conductor, with the normal conductor. But as far as response to electromagnetic waves, I think both could be used for a waveguide just as effectively and hence would have the same me resonance uh, response, I, I assume, for electromagnetic waves. But the main point I was trying to uh, mention here, though, is that it seems like all of this is taking us back to the original topic of, can we have a material that acts as a gravitational wave reflector? And if it can, then we're in business with these transducers and stuff like that. Uh, but if it cannot, then it seems like we're, we're, we, we would uh, continue to hit that wall with um, trying right, to- Right, right. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to go here in a couple of seconds, but uh, there's this nice book, RF Superconducting uh, for Accelerators that has um, a lot of information about coupling of EM to the superconductors. And so I'll try to look into that a little bit as well. Yeah, so um, yeah. Well, let's thank Ray again. It's been a very exciting discussion. And, uh, you know, I think you've generated a lot of interest and uh, hope to, um, you know, we're going to be able to continue our, uh, you know, our, uh, continue trying to further this experiment. And so thank you very much for sharing your work with us. It's very much appreciated. Uh, you're uh, very welcome, Charles. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, bye uh, bye. So, bye. I'm yeah. have to leave too. Okay. Take care, bye everyone. Bye. Hope to see you tomorrow when talking about the second law. Yes, we'll do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.